evening, boys. Good evening, boys and girls. Welcome back to the Highbury Squad. It's been a while. Welcome to the summer series. We're going to have a little bit of fun. It's a mixture of football, film, TV, popular culture, and I couldn't think of a better subject to kick us off. You love Jim. He's back, and this time he's here to really get caught with his pants down. Here we go. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, no matter where in the world you might be. Welcome to the Highbury Squad. I know that we are not broadcasting at our usual time. Um, we will be doing our eight o'clock slots for the summer series. Welcome to the summer series. It's a little bit of fun that I enjoy as well as talking about football. As you know, I'm very passionate about entertainment. It's my background and we've got some great guests coming up to mix it all up for us. And I couldn't think of a better person to kick off the summer series than lifelong Crystal Palace fan, writer, actor, producer, and someone who's probably got one of the best memoirs out there right now, Mr. Jim Piddock. Welcome back to the Highbury Squad. How are you, Sophie? Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, you've been one very busy man uh, promoting your, um, your memoir. And I have been telling our listeners that they have to have a read. I mean, it's got so many great anecdotes and right. and stories. Um, and you've got some phenomenal, I wanted to start off by sharing with them as well, uh, some of the fun things people are saying about it before we kind of dive into some specifics. This from Seth Myers. Jim has a big heart and a sharp wit, and both are on display in the pages of this book. So effing read it. Very classy. I love that. This one's my favorite, actually. And I've become a huge fan of Russell Brand um, for other reasons. I love his YouTube channel and yeah. and the stuff he's doing on there. Uh, Jim has done that rare thing that perhaps only Michael Caine and David Niven have done before. Conjured a funny, inclusive, whimsical and magical tale. Um, love that from Russell Brand. And Elizabeth McGovern. Oh, I had a bit of a crush on, I'm not going to lie, when I was younger. Uh, when I wasn't gasping or laughing my head off, I was wondering why my life is so boring compared to Jim Piddock's. I thought the same thing, Elizabeth. And this one from Hugh Bonville, love Hugh. Hilarious, passionate, beautifully told, and memor memorably waspish, which is quintessential Hugh, I think. Um, yeah. You could just picture him saying that. So, Jim, how does a lad from Rochester you know, become passionate about football. There's a one-man show about a goalkeeper, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and then find himself in the United States with literally 100 bucks in his pocket. Well, uh, it was one of those weird kind of confluences of events. I'd worked for a couple of years in England in uh, weekly rep and fortnightly rep, which doesn't exist anymore. <clears throat> which is sheer madness. You do a different play each week while you're rehearsing another one while you're in the, in the daytime. Um, and I'd, I'd worked uh, in England for a couple of years and I was in my early 20s and um, my father had just died and I was suddenly unemployed and I kind of was fairly depressed. And um, I remember sort of sitting in a, a bed sit. Uh, it was in an attic uh, room I had. It's a tiny, tiny room with a black and white TV uh, watching the 1980 Academy Awards, feeling very sorry for myself. And Dustin Hoffman gave this lovely speech about how he was accepting the award on behalf. He got it for Tootsie. Um, uh, I think, no, it was Kramer versus Kramer. <clears throat> saying he, he was accepting the award on all struggling actors out there because this represents you as much as anyone and blah, blah, blah. And I was, of course, by the end of the speech, a, a self-pitying, sobbing mess. It was an ugly sight. Um, and soon after that, I, I, um, I thought I wanted to get away somehow. And, and my drama school... Uh, the drama studio in London had opened up a branch in Berkeley. And so I very cheekily went to their principal and um, said, you know, would it be OK if I directed something there? I directed a couple of plays in rep while I'd, I'd done rep. And, and he said, well, direct something here first and we'll see. And um, I, I did something and he fortunately offered me a job there for three months. 
And, and I went out there just to escape for three months. And I thought, I'll just take a break and, and get a different perspective on things. And I fell in love with California immediately. I mean, I just thought it was just this wonderful, open, new, beautiful place, so sunny. And, and, um, the opposite just, of England. <laughs> yeah, it just felt like there was possible, endless possibilities and, and um, not so rigid a society. And I had in my back pocket when I was doing this, just directing for three months uh, and teaching a couple of classes at the school, I had this one-man show that I'd seen in London about a, a football goalie or soccer goalie playing a game. And, and I'd loved it. And I thought I'd love to try and do it somewhere. And, and I asked the writer, Peter Flannery, who was, who was quite well known at that time and still is, uh, if I could do it in America. And, and he said, sure, if you can find anyone crazy enough to put it on, you know, you can do it. And, and I took it around every theater in San Francisco. And of course, you know, it was the 1980. No one was interested in 1981 at that point. No one was interested in football at, at that point. And um, I was an unknown actor uh, with a very British play about football. So they all turned me down quite rightly. And um, <laughs> I was about to come back and I got a call from the artistic director of one of the theaters, a small 99 seat theater in San Francisco. And he said, our first play has fallen out of the season, can you get the show up in, in, in three, four weeks? And I said, of course I can, and I canceled my flight. And I hired a great director called Richard Side, a Brit I've met out there, and we got the show up. And I had a full night of 99 people on the first night because all the people I was directing at the drama school wanted to see me fall flat on my face and fail. <laughs> and um, the second night I had four people in the audience. It was, a, it was an intimate experience and um, they were lovely. They all sat at the front. And, um, <laughs> and I did the show, which was incredibly energetic. It's an hour and a half, two 45-minute halves of non-stop action, talking, moving, diving, shouting, this, that, the other. And then I have a nervous breakdown in the course of the, the, the play. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, it, it the reviews came out the following day after that second night of four people. And um, they were kind of dream reviews that any actor would literally die for and um the show was then it sold out for the rest of the run and then extended twice and it, and it, it took me to new york because a, a, a producer there had seen it i thought heard about it and wanted to do it off broadway but the day i arrived in new york um she pulled her money out of my show and put it into a musical so i was stuck in new york with just a videotape of this show and i i gave it to an agent and they sent me on an audition and um, it was for George C. Scott was directing and starring in Present Laughter by George. Wow, by, um, what a Noel legend. Park. I know, and, and I got the part. So I was playing his valet in this. It was a nice, really nice role in this Broadway show, which became a big hit. And so I suddenly went from being uh, an unemployable and unemployed actor, uh, self-pitying actor in London uh, with two years of crap theatre under his belt to starring on Broadway uh, within a year. Uh, it was pretty much the only time my career has gone into absolute overdrive in such a short space of time. It's generally been a very steady curve upwards, that sort of tortoise and the hare kind of career. Um, so it was it was really quite exciting. I mean, life was really coming at me fast. And, and wow. then, you know, from there on, I never really looked back in terms of the theatre and then I sort of started again when I came to LA to do film and TV. But that was that to answer your question in a fairly long way is how I ended up uh, in America. It, it's so it's so funny, though, that, you know, when some people say, oh, you know, it's the same old story. But it is in terms of I came to, you know, California or New York, you know, as an artist and I had, you know, tuppence. And I mean, you know, Clooney's got a story. Everyone's got a story. You have a story and it's. It's so true because, you know, that's why I, I I know that people may look at talent these days and say, oh, well, they can't complain. They make so much money and whatever. But so many and have come from, yeah. you know, absolutely nothing. And also I don't think what people realize is a large percentage of people in SAG or AFTRA are not in that high you know, two percent bracket. They're grafters and they yeah. they slog every single day. It is not an, e an easy industry is it Jim and, and one that if you have impatience it's not it's just not one for you for all the kids that are listening out there yeah it's an incredibly competitive profession it, it always has been and it always will be um, I do think that um, <clears throat> right now it's more 
geared like the rest of the world is to people who are entrepreneurial. If you can, you know, direct your own film on your iPhone and get it out there. If you can, you know, write something that you can be in and get it out there. I think, you know, in the time that I'm talking about, the early 80s, I think America was a bit more open to that kind of entrepreneurial attitude. Whereas in England, I'd have probably been told to sit down and take my place in line. So, um, but I think things have changed and I think the world has changed. And I think we've entered an entrepreneurial age. So I would I would recommend that to anyone going into any profession is, is be entrepreneurial. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, now, I just want to, you have to give me one George C. Scott anecdote. I know a classic one about, you know, um, I mean, he, he was definitely a drinker, but yeah. for those um, who are younger and we do have, you know, um, a, an audience of Generation Xs and Baby Boomers and Millennials and Zers as well. Um, you, If you're younger, you probably know George C. Scott from A Christmas Carol, which is probably one of the greatest Christmas movies ever made and best Absolutely. version ever made. Yeah. Um, but he was quite the thespian. And give me, give us a George C. Scott story. Well, George was the first major star I'd ever work with. And he didn't like to rehearse because it impinged on his drinking time and his watching baseball time. Um, so we would rehearse for like four or five hours a day max. And, and like Christine Larty was in that production and um, she she was from a method school of acting. So she would always stop and say, okay, George, so um, what, what's my objective in this scene? And, and he'd just say to her, your objective is get on the stage. Say your line and get the hell off. <laughs> and that, that would be it. And then I remember the last, the last night we had a uh, we closed the show on a matinee a Sunday afternoon. But the last evening performance was a sun, Saturday night. Um, we had the Sunday matinee the next day, and we went out to Gallagher's Steakhouse in New York. And George bought everyone dinner. And I've never ever in my life seen any human being consume so much alcohol that night as that night. I mean, we started late because it was after the show. So we probably got there at 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I think I left there about three, maybe four, and uh, with the rest of the cast. And, uh, and I was pretty worse for wear. <laughs> and, that's, not, um, that's not apple juice. <laughs> no, was my first pint of the evening. At six I love it. London, 6.15 here in London. Um, so the next day, I went into the theatre and I was going to my dressing room. And his door was halfway open. And I heard this voice go, Jimmy, get in here. So I went in and he was sitting there in his boxers. And with George, the less clothes he had on, the more drunk he was. That was how you <laughs> tell how drunk he was. That's so classic. sitting there in his boxers. And um, he started to talk to me and I couldn't understand a word he was saying. I was a phone going. I had to tell you, I had a mad up phone. And just going on and on. And I realized he was drinking in his dressing room. I realized he'd been up all night. That much I did understand from what he was saying was that he had not <laughs> been to bed and he was drinking through the entire night in the morning, Sunday morning. And now we were 10 to 3 on a Sunday afternoon. Wow. And he was inc incoherent. And I went to the stage manager. I quickly got out of there, went to the stage manager and said, we're not going to do this show. You know, he's incapable. And he said, well, we kind of have to because there's an audience sitting there and the understudy's really gone home. <laughs> So uh, we we did the show and um, it was extraordinary because he didn't miss a beat, not a word, not a move, nothing. He was his performance was exactly as it had been on every other show. And the rest of us were terrified. It was absolutely terrifying. Wow. It, but extraordinary. And um, I still to this day uh, have no idea how any human being could consume that amount of alcohol and let live, let alone do a show. Unbelievable. Wow. What an absolute legend all the way yeah. through. What great memories. And you, yeah. um, and by the way, George C. Scott is a baseball fan. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? I guess he lived, he, he was, he lived, he was living here for a while, wasn't he? Is that how he became a baseball fan? He, he was, um, he was a massive Detroit Tigers fan because he was from Michigan. So he was a big Detroit Tigers fan. He lived at that time in um, in upstate New York, I believe, or Connecticut. Uh, and then he, he came out to L.A. He had a place in L.A. that he moved to not that long after, and he died, I mean, probably four or five years after that. Um, so it did catch up with him in the end. Well, this book has 38 fascinating chapters, and 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but you started jotting down your memoirs in 81. So I'm assuming that was with a pencil and, and paper. How, how, wh what were you thinking at the time? I mean, a lot of people like a diary. They like to chronicle stuff. Um, your journey was already kicking off to be a fascinating one. Am I right? Did you start jotting no. things? No, no, I didn't. No, I, I didn't scri scribble anything down. I mean, I kept a diary. I've kept a diary two different years in my life, I think. I can't remember what years they were. One of them was in 1981. I did actually write a diary that year. So I kind of right. had a very vivid account of that first year. And then I did it once later. But but no, I really only started writing. And, and I, I'm not sure if I even went back to that one-year diary because it was so detailed and boring. And it was full of things like, you know, I felt crappy today. Maybe I've got a cold. Really, really dull. So, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so uh, I really only started writing it w when the pandemic hit. And uh, um, it was sort of, I wanted to do a one-man show originally because I'd done this talk in Beverly Hills that people rather liked where I kind of Q&A things for the Screen Actors Guild in a 200-seat theatre. And um, so I kind of came away thinking maybe I'll do a one-man show and, I don't have to learn anything because I can just tell stories and, and sit down now and again. Uh, so I started that, but it, it was about 10 hours long. So I, I realized that I couldn't <laughs> all myself through that. What's, and, then, and then I wrote the book. What's hard? You've written so many amazing pieces. Um, we'll, we'll get stuck into some of those. But what's harder to write, you know, when you're writing about yourself and putting together a memoir? versus a teleplay you know script film oh, script way 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 harder writing about myself mm -hmm. you know um i i couldn't sort of uh, i spent you know a good the first 30 years of my career trying to avoid being me by by, by hiding behind characters and being a, 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 a consummate or a, a constipated um, character actor uh, and and then i kind of got more comfortable playing things uh, closer to myself and actually doing some hosting and presenting of things where I was myself. Um, and, and writing is a similar experience. I, I like kind of losing myself in someone else's story um, or a story that I'm interested in. So it was quite painful writing this. It was quite pulling teeth, really. Um, and I, you know, with a screenplay or television show, I can write for eight, nine hours a day. Well, with this, I could do three to four hours max, and then I was my head would blow up. Um, I found it hard. I found it hard. And it's also much harder writing prose, writing mm. a book, than it is writing a, a screenplay, which is just a specific craft. So I, I found it quite a struggle. Um, that said, it didn't take me much more than five months to write the first draft. So that's fairly quick. Um, but I did have a lot of the stuff in my head. So. Right. What well, when that moment when, you know, I mean, when you when you're in the entertainment industry, it's it's uh, we have a lot of listeners who just they love they're so passionate about their film and their TV, yeah. and that moment where you actually sell something, you know, someone wants to buy your material. What what yeah. was the first thing? What was that moment like when you actually sold something to a studio or a production company or? It was incredibly liberating. I mean, I, I was an actor for the first 10 years of my career. Uh, yeah, 12 years. And then I, I wrote with my ex-wife. We had this uh, appalling dog that we adopted. And it was just, it, it was, um, <laughs> she was, I adored her, but she was insane. Absolutely insane. She would headbutt people. She would run, just madness. And um, she kind of destroyed our, our house and our lives um, and we thought it was quite amusing in some way. So we, we wrote uh, a screenplay about that. So I wrote the first draft, um, Margaret wrote the second, and we kind of did a third. And we gave it to her agent. She was she had encouraged me to write because she knew, could see I was getting bored just acting. And um, I, I had more time on my hands than when I was doing theatre. So I wrote that, and, and, and then she wrote, wrote it, and we wrote it, and we sold it um, for quite a lot of money. And um, suddenly I had this... Um, huge uh, amount of money in my bank account, which I'd never had before in my life, and um, and I had a whole new career. It was it was like opening a fantastic door, and I was suddenly like, oh, this is amazing. Now I've got something to do, and I'm not not acting, 
and it fulfills a totally different part of my brain, a different creative uh, thing. Mm. Uh, it was really liberating, and, and I, I gave me a focus that I has never gone away since then. That was 1989, 1990. Well, for me... I love a lot of the stuff that you do, as you know. I mean, we talk about football a lot. And, you know, um, when you were on last, uh, you know, we we talked about Ian Wright and Brighty and and shared some of, of your pictures from your, your football days. And, of course, here you are with Eddie Izzard, which is oh, a, yeah. this is a, a classic picture of the cut you. Final, and- <laughs> the cut final with a lot of my very good friends right behind. Yeah. Uh, and here you are with Eric Idle and Gary Lineker. Um, yeah, at the Galaxy. At the uh, LA, LA Galaxy game. Um, and, of course, Arsenal legend Eddie McGoldrick right here. Eddie. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, you, 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 you're, so, you're such a champion for a lot of people, but there's also been someone, I think, who's been influential in your life when it comes to entertainment and we'll get to Fred in just a minute, but Christopher and his way of working and how much of an influence did he have on, on you, Jim? Christopher gets movies are absolutely genius. In my opinion, the improvisation yeah. part of it, was that really the catalyst? You'd done a lot of stuff, but did this just take you to another level when you work with him? My go-to movie when I'm sick, when I'm depressed, <laughs> When I'm feeling blue is best in show. It is the greatest. It's in my top 10 movies of all time. It's genius. It's it's in a lot of people's top 10, which is great. Um, That was my first film with Chris. Um, And and I think it changed things for me in the sense that I would, my acting career sort of faded a bit and I was writing almost exclusively Um, up until that point, you know, the last, it was the the late nineties when we shot that. And, um, and I'd sort of, was kind of like oh well I think it's been cancelled my acting career without mutual consent and um, <laughs> and then I got a call from Eugene Levy and said look we're doing this film as a follow up to Waiting for Guffman and it's about a dog show and we think you you know I I've recommended you to Chris because I think you'd be good for it and I, I met them and and um, they're both kind of very socially shy shall we say or awkward and uh, I just sort of ended up babbling Chris doesn't audition you he just meets you and he has a gut instinct whether you can do improvisation or not. And I had done none really since drama school. Um, but I gave him a tape of what some of my work and, and I left. And um, and I got a call on the way home saying, you know, um, I'd love you to be in the film. Um, so I said, yeah, sure. Um, uh, and, and that was my first. And, and it really, um, I mean, it's the first of, I think, five five things I've done with Chris, two of which I've written with him. Um, series for HBO called Family Tree and, and BBC, uh, and then a film called Mascots for, for Netflix, and then three other films before I wrote with them. Uh, and I think what it did for me, best in show, um, I'd never played a straight man in a comedy kind of duo before. I'd always been the clown. So it taught me how to do that and mm. to be economically funny and economical with my acting because I had to be very real to make people think I was a real dog show host, uh, commentator rather, and, and 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 let Fred run with it, because Fred is a genius at what he does, and you can't compete with that. And I knew that right away. And so I I sort of sat right road shotgun and went, I've got to be, I've got to make him funnier and also get a few laughs myself. And and the straighter I am and the more I react rather than try and counter him with by being funny myself the better it will be for this chemistry and 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 luckily it, it was it was wonderful the chemistry and i um when i saw the film which we i mean we shot all our stuff because i was doing another show in london i, I had to i had one day and we were supposed to have three but we did it in one because we ran out of time and and, and i can't believe that that amount of film has ever ended up in a film i mean from one day because we we're in the whole second half of the movie um, so it's about 45 minutes in and out, in and out, mm-hmm. all of it. And, and it was a great revelation to me because I did realize that you can be, you can be rather than act with a capital A. You just have to kind of ride with it. 
Uh, and that was a real revelation. And I think my acting got better after that because I was less, I was more subtle and more, I, I did more with my reactions and my face and my wordlessly that I realized you don't have to speak to be funny or you don't have to talk in improvisation, you can react. And um, so it was a, it was a re big learning thing for me. I've occasionally fallen off the wagon and given grotesquely over the top performances, too. <laughs> but um, but that was that was a great one for me, and, and 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 it was a great kind of being part of that family, that improvisational family for um, about fifteen years. Does it baffle you sometimes with? As a publicist, it always sometimes it, I always used to think, wow, you know, you think this movie is going to be huge and then, you know, you get those little sleeper hits and stuff and then you have actors in performances where they, they feel like, you know, this is life's work and then you do a, a role and then you probably get more recognised and you can correct me if I'm wrong or something like this, which is kind of a classic, iconic scene in lethal weapon yes then you know maybe some other projects i mean yeah does it does it still baffle you to this day about the impact like this particular scene had well i i don't i don't know if it baffles me i mean god i look young in that photo but that my, that <laughs> i have another one we'll get to independence yeah, day <laughs> independence day yeah i mean lethal weapon was my first ever film um and it was odd because that line I had to to, to Danny Glover and, and Joe Pesci uh, when they he says why can't he emigrate to South Africa, Joe, uh, Danny Glover and I said because you're blick. <laughs> uh, that became the catchphrase of the movie, which so it was odd for my first movie to be the guy who delivered the catchphrase. Uh, and I have one scene. Um, yeah, people still do yell that line at me now and again and they're by the way they usually are blick themselves um, <laughs> which is great it's a great icebreaker uh, so i mean and it bridges generations i mean i've had young rappers who i normally not know what to say you know <laughs> young american rapper than me i mean hello what are we going to talk about i love uh, it though. and then and then you know the, the ice is broken when you meet them and someone's uh, they look at you and go but you're blick and that's <laughs> off you go that's very um, cool so, so yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, that best in show probably because that did transcend most of Chris's stuff from cult to being mainstream almost. And, and, and oddly, an episode of Friends, I did one episode of Friends that, that has been seen in billions of countries. Well, that's not true because there aren't billions of countries. It's been seen in hundreds of countries. By billions of by people. Billions of people. Um, and, and that strangely is and again it's multi-generational so so like two generations beyond what who first saw it have now seen it uh, and people go oh yeah you were in friends i'm in the episode and so that's weird to me that's more weird than lethal weapon because lethal weapon and independence day were the two biggest films of their respective years they were the two biggest box office films so that doesn't surprise me that much even though right. i didn't have a massive amount to do in either one um but friends does surprise me i mean it doesn't now because i figured it out why but but when people kept saying friends you know i was like really okay yeah uh, well bizarre. it's not easy um you know moving from film to film or tv show and uh, writing and as great of, as your experiences have been and i think i'll let people read the book but um you did work on independence day i actually work with uh Roland Emmerich on the day after tomorrow. Oh yeah, um, which uh, yeah, he was he was a uh, he was a, a nice director to to work with. You you do call a couple people out in the book, and I think you guys should read it. But feel free to share any stories. And I do have to ask you about whether or not you were surprised with what happened at the Academy Awards and yeah. Mr. Yeah. Smith. Well, first of all, I should say that one of the people I, I do give it to in the book, and by the way, it's mostly a very positive book, and I, I have good things to say about mm. people, and some people who have bad reputations, and I say I didn't experience that at all. Um, Roland Emmerich was definitely not one of them. I loved him. He was just like an enthusiastic, mad German teacher who was bouncing around with enthusiasm and energy. Yeah. Um, I, 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 uh, there's a chapter in the book 
uh, work which I start by saying there are 10 A-list actors I've worked with, uh, nine I loved, and, um, and one was uh, four asterisks word. And uh, if I can find, I can actually list, list the, if I've got a copy right here, uh, just happen to have a copy here. Um, the 10 are Michael Caine, Angela Lansbury, Anthony Hopkins, Sharon Stone, Tom Hanks, Morgan Fairchild, Sasha Baron Cohen, Naomi Campbell, Kevin Hart, and Faye Dunaway. So of those, nine I really liked, and one was a four asterisk word, and you can pick whatever word you like for that, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Um, <laughs> and that chapter has obviously got quite a lot of attention because I do name names, and um, that's unusual in these type of biographies uh, or memoirs. And the person who ends up being, and I'm not going to give that away because that is a spoiler alert, Yeah. Um, really did deserve to get it with both barrels. Um, there was, I think, three people I really, really stick it to in the book. Um, and as I say, there are some people in that list who people would say, well, it's got to be them because they, they have a terrible reputation. And I rehabilitate their reputation by saying <laughs> how great they were. So... I do feel this book is ultimately extremely positive and and it's a it's a romp through four decades in Hollywood not a not a hatchet job although I definitely pull the hammer when I need to and and absolutely I don't just eviscerate people I urinate on their corpse afterwards <laughs> um, and one of, the, one of them's dead so they can't sue me um one of them it remains a mystery but I'll tell you the other because people are, won't be that surprised by it when I first got to Hollywood, I auditioned for a show called Seinfeld, which was a huge, huge show at the time. And uh, I, I went in for this role, which is supposed to be British, and I was in my early 30s, and they did, clearly didn't know what they want because there was actors all ages. There was a, a British actor in his 60s. And I went into the room, and there was Larry David, the show's creator, at his desk. It was in his office. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld was there, and some producers, and the casting director. And I, as I started the scene, reading with the casting director, um, Larry David put his feet up on the desk, opened a newspaper, and was completely obscured from my view. And I was obscured from his view. And he remained that way for the entire audition. Now, it threw me big time. However, being a consummate professional, I soldiered on, thanks mostly to Jerry Seinfeld and some of the others laughing at what I was doing, and got to the end and bolted out of there. I was really fuming as I went, left the studio, went to my car. And then the older actor who was in the waiting room came out, the guy in his 60s, and he was bright red in the face and clearly upset, visibly upset. And I sort of said, are you okay? And he said, he told me the exact same thing had happened to him. Now, I can only conclude that Larry David, who people love in, in um, uh, what's that show? Curb like, Your Enthusiasm. Uh, which is a, you know, it's very good, and he's extraordinarily talented. I can't watch it because of my experience with him. But he's either, I concluded he had to be either the biggest asshole on the planet, solution A, or solution B, the biggest asshole on the planet. <laughs> uh, and I have not changed my mind since. Yeah, fair and enough. He, he's one of the people I, I give it to both barrels. Yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, so a, a, a good experience you had before. I've got I've got some uh, need to find out some favourites of yours, but there's a yeah. couple of things I do want to touch on. Um, comedians that I've worked with aren't necessarily you. You you're very unique in terms of my experience. Uh, I looked after Robin Williams for a bit and uh, on a couple of films, and I found him to be a very s sad person. And of course, you know, that we, we all know about his struggles and just some other comedians that are a little darker in real life right. than, or maybe, you know, then not as outgoing perhaps. Um, right. You seem to have this incredible balance, you know, um, which I find unique in terms of my experiences. Have you found that? I mean, when you've, what you've worked with some, super talented people and of course people like Eugene Livy and 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 Chris Guest and and some others um uh, also yeah. Kevin Hart you mentioned um you know you what, am I off off base or no, have you no, found I, that in your career first of all thank you for that but um 
I think the big difference is between being a comedian and a comic actor. I'm, I'm an actor, first and foremost. Um, I actually do probably as much, if not more, drama than comedy these days. Um, but I, I was always an actor, and that's a different breed than a stand-up comedian. Stand-up comedians are, by and large, manic depressives or bipolar. You know, they they really are go to extremes. I mean, it's an incredibly vulnerable thing to do to stand up and put yourself on on display. Although, having said that, I just wrote a book that completely puts myself on display. But um, <laughs> but most actors, I would say, you know, two thirds of the actors I've ever worked with are introverts, and I'm in that group, believe it or not. And and a third are natural extroverts who just are, are like a, a, a bit. They're not like stand-up comedians. They're just more people that are ha quite happy just showing off. And um, and I don't know why that is. I think, you know, a lot of people become actors because it's the only way they can be seen and heard if they're that shy or that introverted. And certainly I would say that's probably the case for me uh, and a lot of actors I know. And, and a lot are very insecure. But I do know some people who are, can't find the right balance. It's hard. I think for me, the sanity structure was having a life outside of it. I wanted to lead a normal life. I never bought into the factory being my whole life, even though LA is a factory town. And, and I think, and I remember a guy at university saying, you know, you're very good at what you're acting. If you do that for, for a profession, don't stop playing football because that will keep you sane. And, and it's true. He went on to be a great sports uh, journalist. Um, and, and, and I think it's true. And I think that, that I've I've played football for 50 something years and I still play on Saturdays or Sundays, uh, some weekends. And that kept me sane because most of the people I've played with uh, aren't involved in show business. Some, very few are. Some are in the music business in LA, but most of the guys I play with are just regular guys who have normal jobs. And that was very healthy for me. And my continued passion for Crystal Palace and staying involved in as a fan as well as a amateur player mm -hmm. i think the football kept me real and and it kept me away from becoming uh too obsessive because you know it's very easy to get obsessive for me uh and for most people who choose vocational lives yeah. so i think that football kept me on the straight and narrow to be honest i can i could totally see see that there's um I think it's it kind of grounds us back to where we started and yeah. you know takes you back to those places. Although being an Arsenal fan these days will drive anyone to uh, insanity, that's well, for sure. But well, we'll, 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 this, this. Um, speaking right. of a guy who has it together, I I have to ask you this because I got a few uh, notes from some of our listeners wanting to know. They're such huge fans, of course, and I I think it was your project that really had people take up and take notice of him more as an actor. You cannot leave this show today without letting people know if this dude is legit. Yeah. Um, I, I, I uh, had heard great things about him uh, when, before we cast him in the film. Um, and when I went on set, uh, I wasn't particularly involved in the production of it because I, I was wrote the story for it and was executive producer, and I, I was doing something else. So I just went up to the set for a few days. And I, when I arrived, um, I, I hadn't met Dwayne, and he stopped the shooting and, and gathered everybody together, the cast and the crew. And it's a lot of people, it's like a couple of hundred people, and said, I just want you to know that this is the man who's responsible for you being here, and introduced me that way. Now, no one in my life has ever done that for a writer on the set of a movie. I mean, the writer on a movie is sort of, I mean, I was an executive producer too, so I had a bit more kind of clout, but the writer is just, please don't come anywhere near the set. And if you do, just stay by the craft services and fill your face with food. <laughs> um, like the devil. Craft services are the devil. Devil's, <laughs> devil's work. Um, uh, it's different in television. You're the king as a writer producer, but... I, I just thought that was so classy and so mm -hmm. way and above the call of duty that uh, he just went shooting up, in my estimation, even more. And he was lovely in the film. He was fantastic in the film, as was Julie Andrews and Billy Crystal and Steve Merchant and Seth MacFarlane and, and all the other great and, uh, um, 
Ashley Judd. There's so many good people in that film. It's a lovely yeah. film. It's a very sweet film that's been seen by millions of people the world over. And it just fills me with pride because that film came from an idea I had talking to my daughter, who was 11 at the time, over dinner. And, and I wanted to write a film about Santa Claus. And we, we talked a bit and I realized they'd all been done. And so I said, what about the tooth fairy? And she said, it's a great idea, dad. And we talked over dinner and, and I wrote down what we talked about the next day and then pitched it to a producer and, and we sold it and it became this big kind of thing. It, it was a very smooth journey actually to, to production. Uh, and I, it, to this day, I feel a great pride because obviously it's a much more mainstream than the normal stuff I do and very, mm -hmm. you know, it's not going to win any Academy Awards. But I think it's a really lovely film. I, I remember Steve Merchant at the premiere. We were talking afterwards and he said, you'd have to be very hard of heart not to like this film. It, it, yeah. it, it's lovely. It's very sweet. It's an old fashioned, what the sort of film Disney used to make, uh, even though it was 20th Century Fox. Uh, and I feel very proud of that film in the sense that, that that one idea that I had over dinner with my daughter ended up employing two or 300 people and making 130 million at the box office and infinitely more in ancillary markets. And it's an That's evergreen, very, it's, an, it's what we call, I think, an evergreen title. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and yeah, as I say, it's never going to win any awards, but I do feel a sense of, sort of pride that that, that that, that happened, that film. Yeah. yeah. Well, one more that um, a couple of folks wrote that wanted to know, because you were talking about the cast of um, Tooth Fairy there. Um, another film that you were in that uh, is is watched by many, um, Jason Segal, Emily Blunt, Kevin Hart, right. Chris Pratt, Dakota Johnson, Reese e Evans. Um, I, pro I always probably bastardize his last name. Uh, the last the 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 five year engagement um, again another good experience for you oh, on, on that fabulous. one with that cast fabulous uh, I I have had many many wonderful actors uh, actresses play my wife or daughter in movies many many but that movie contained probably my favorite two it was Jackie Weaver played my ex wife actually. And I adore Jackie. She's this wonderful Australian actress who's just brilliant. And, and Emily Blunt, uh, I, I just adore. I adore her. I adore her work. I adore her. She's just wonderful. And she was she, she was just the best uh, theatre of theatre, the film daughter one could ever have. And there's on, on my website, I have a comedy reel and a drama reel. And it's worth watching the comedy reel to see the outtakes of our first scene together in that film. Um, <laughs> there's no clips from the film. It's just that outtakes of this one scene that never made it to the film because we just had this relationship from day one where she couldn't look me in the eye and I couldn't look her in the eye without us just bursting out laughing. And it's, it's so exciting when that happens. It's such a weird kind of soul thing that you both share some weird thing. Um, and you know, I'm old enough to be a, probably a no, I'm old enough to be a father, not a grandfather. But but it was just this lovely kind of dynamic, and I, and I, and I, I, it still makes me laugh when I watch those outtakes because she's so adorable and she just made me laugh so much. And and and, and it, it, it's uh, that was a wonderful experience that film. And and she is is great. And Jason, I've worked with twice, and and he's equally as adorable in a different way. He's just such a great guy. Uh, and Nick Stoller, the director, is, is wonderful. It was it was a fabulous experience. And my only sadness is that we were in it a lot more, the parents, but they kind of made it a much younger movie. And so David Paymer and and um, and Jackie, myself, uh, and Mimi um, uh, Mimi Kennedy, who was the, the, we were the four parents. Uh, the three of them all have Academy Award nominations. I was the old man out. I don't. <laughs> And, and it was just so great to be in the, those people's company and we all liked each other very much. And sadly, you know, they did sort of make it much more of a younger person's movie. So we got a bit cut out of the movie. Uh, and actually Kevin, Kevin was in that movie. And then Kevin, I did this film with Kevin where I played his butler, which was, which was great. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't seen Family Tree and What About Dick uh, and... 
What about Dick? Uh, is on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, that's on on Netflix. Um, and Bly Manor, you're in, which a lot of my cousins yeah. love. Very dark. Very dark. Yeah, that looks a bit more like me because it wasn't so long ago. <laughs> um, you know, you can catch Jim on a, in on a on a bunch of really just fantastic projects. Um, and you know, I'm going to get you out on some quick fire ones, but before I do, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know that family is really important to you. And you did say yeah. that, you know, and the book is, you guys will love the book, Caught With Your Pants Down um, and Tales From Hollywood. It's available on Amazon, in um, on Kindle, uh, audiobook, hardcover. Go grab a copy today. You will not regret it. It's just brilliant. Um, it's it's a really enjoyable read and listen. And well, you do have some... Your, sorry, while you're doing your sales pitch, I just want to interrupt. All yeah. the money from the book goes to I've, three different charities. And look, I've got it at the bottom, Jim. To let everyone know because well, I do. I've had it scrolling on the there bottom. There we go. Fantastic. Sorry, I'm. I'm I yeah. Can't no. Really no. I wanted yeah. you to let everyone know exactly where the money's going. Yeah. No. That you can see it down there on the on yep. the little screen account. Yeah. So yep. yeah, that that's. Um, I don't make a cent out of this, so uh, there's a good reason to buy it. Don't. don't Absolutely, uh, an well. incredible charities. But there is there are some poignant moments in the book, you know, again, where I feel like you humanize um, what, you know, the, the, the different part I don't think that people see a lot of the time is whether you're a sports star or whether you're a film actor, you know, whether we're working for a corporation, we're all human at the end of the day. And you talk about family um, and you have an incredible, dare I say, better half. I think you would agree with that. Uh, who, heart, I call her. <laughs> I who comes her. from you know Hollywood royalty herself? Uh, just before we have a little bit of fun on the exit here, talk to me about the importance of that. And again, I think it goes back to what you were saying: football kind of saved you, but also you know being part of this relationship and what it has meant to you to have yeah. that stability. Well, I think the book became oddly it had a sort of subtext which I only discovered when I was writing it. Um, amidst all the kind of anecdotes and funny stories and sad stories um, in there, I, I, I realized it was partly a journey of a search for family. Um, even though I, I, I grew up in a quite a stable family, uh, it, it, it sort of, and Family Tree, the show I did with Chris, sort of reflects that kind of obsession with mine of, of understanding what family means. And, and I, I'm proud to say now I believe I have kind of four families, my immediate family, which is Annie Cusack and my daughter Ali, um, and my blood family, and my Crystal Palace family, and my showbiz family. So I have four wonderful families. Um, I think, I think that 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 you're right. I mean, the center of the book, there are two chapters right in the middle are about the death of a great friend of mine who was like a brother to me, um, uh, at a very age uh, in Hollywood. He died in a fire, um, one of the horrible fires that we get out there. Um, and he was 41. Uh, it was ridiculous. Um, so um, I think those two chapters and then the following one about adopting my daughter um, at very short notice, extraordinary kind of adoption story that I think is fairly unique. Uh, and the relationship with my daughter, which is so wonderful and enduring. Um, and then finding really the true love of my life, I think, at the age of 55. Uh, in, in Annie, um, I, I think that, that those are the stories in the book that I hope make it transcend it being a showbiz mm -hmm. memoir. I, don't, I didn't want it to be a showbiz memoir, firstly because my name doesn't sell it. People kind of know roughly who I am if they see my face and or they know what I've done, but they don't really know my name. And so, so I wanted it to be a book for everybody, and, and that's one of the joys so far of having written it is that it seems to have struck a chord with people who aren't in show business, which I love. And I, and I think that that is an important part of the book, as you say, and, and family becomes the story in a sense of, of the book. And, and my, I, I, the I think you'll make a great film. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I do think I should do the one man show at some point and, I, and I'm mm. actually working on it right now. And it's become um, less about Hollywood and much more about the search for family. And, and that, that basically all the casts I've ever been in were sort of surrogate families for me. 
and how I, I was always searching for that. So I think that that's kind of, I think that's kind of an interesting arena for a lot of people. Love that. Family is, and I love how you, you break down the family and, and how and what it can be in different ways. Uh, and yeah. I think that's it's really special. Blood. It's yeah. not about blood or about, in, 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 you know, um, bloodlines. It's nothing to do with that. All right. Um, let's get you out on these quick five bits. Um, yeah. Now, what is your favorite film, Mr. Piddock? Well, whenever people do this to me, I'm always really You hate annoyed. it, don't you? <laughs> well, I, I never narrow it down to one. I prevaricate. I sit on the fence and I'll give you a couple of alternatives. But with the film, I mean, there's so many great films that have been made. But my personal favorite that I've probably watched more than any other film is With Nell and I, um, oh. which is a small it's not really a cult film anymore because it's become such a widely known cult film. Uh, it's a big favorite among a lot of comedians and comic actors. Steve Martin, I think it's one of his favorite films. And I, it is a film made in the eighties, mid eighties. And I think it's a work of genius. Um, and uh, with Nell and I is the most quotable film imaginable. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but with Nell and I would be my answer to that. one. All right. Uh, TV show. Uh, I think the, one of the greatest shows ever was MASH. I think it's probably the greatest sitcom ever. Um, but that said, I'm going to give you a couple of alternatives, favourites. I think Freaks and Geeks, which was short-lived, was one of the greatest series I've ever seen. And a show I was in called Party Down, which in, was created by some of the same people from Freaks and Geeks. Party Down is, I think, genius. And that is coming back. They've revived that. They're revived. Oh, that's fantastic. Because it was just the season, wasn't it? Was it one? Uh, no, I think it was two, three, two or three, two seasons, maybe, maybe three. So Freaks and Geeks was one season, but Party Down, I think, did three seasons. Okay. Um, favorite band? Um, the Clash, probably, followed by U2 and Mot, Mot the Hoople, a particular favorite. But but the Clash, I would say, I think for me, covered so many areas. Uh, concert. Bruce Springsteen uh, with The Who followed shortly. Whoa. Yeah. Nice. Favourite city in the world? Well, the two that I live in, Los Angeles and London. Love it. Uh, Favourite drink? Are you drinking it right now? <laughs> no, but I like beer and I have a beer in the summer a lot uh, at this time. Um, red wine is my go-to. Awesome. Your favourite Hollywood scandal? Well, scandal, Hollywood scandals aren't what they used to be. I think the no. great, greatest one, and it's not great, it's horrible, it took place in 1921 when Fatty Arbuckle, first of all, any scandal involving an actor, comedian called Fatty Arbuckle is amusing. <laughs> um, where the amusement ends, because he was charged in 1921 with the rape and murder of a woman called Virginia Rappe, which is odd, considering the subject matter. And it was a party in San Francisco, and this woman that was there alleged that he raped her, I mean, and and that she died because it's, it's awful. The story I don't know why I'm telling this. She <laughs> died because he was so fat he ruptured her bladder when he was raping her, and she died from peritonitis from the ruptured bladder. And he was charged with murder, and uh, it was a big scandal. It was the biggest scandal probably in Hollywood history. And he was found not guilty, actually. And the jury even offered him an apology because they, the, the, the witness who claimed this was a sort of a notorious liar and con woman. And um, he was is issued an apology. Um, and I'm not going to say whether he's guilty or not, but his career never recovered and he died at the age of 40-something shortly afterwards. Wow. I don't, I don't think they make scandals like that anymore in Hollywood. I mean... Will Smith slapping, uh, slapping uh, Chris it? Rock. Chris, Chris, Chris Rock. Rock is not exactly comparable, you know, to that. That that really, for me, takes the biscuit. Well, my Hugh Grant on Hollywood Boulevard is boring that's compared to that. That's, no, that's a pretty good one. But what I loved one. about what that was that Hugh just went straight on to the talk shows and just copped to it. He just copped totally. to it. I loved that about him, and I thought it was really brave and really smart. And, and he just said, okay, have a good laugh at me, and, and let's get it out of the way. And, his, of course, he's recovered from that. 
completely recovered from that, like gloriously. And talk about really getting caught with one pants down. That was yeah, uh, yeah. That was that was definitely Hugh. Right. A uh, few football ones to end on. We have to. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah. A game you never saw but wish you can transport yourself to. Any this, game, any era, any time, domestic or international. This is easy. I mean, people would say for me, because it was when I fell in, fell in love with football, the 1966 World Cup final. But I saw it on television. So I was there in some shape. The big one for me is my, it was, took place on my birthday, my 34th birthday, in 1990, the 8th of April, 1990, when Crystal Palace played in the semi-final of the FA Cup against Liverpool, having lost to Liverpool 9-0 earlier in that season, and we won 4-3 in extra time. That has to be, first of all, the greatest Palace game in the history of the club in terms of drama and not its overall importance, but for most people's memory. And I unfortunately couldn't go to that uh, and I didn't even see it on television. I woke up because it was at four o'clock in the morning in LA, and I woke up to a message on my answering machine with a, a friend screaming, a Palace fan screaming, we won, we can't fucking believe that, we won, we won. It was insane. <laughs> and then I've watched that game at two or three times since, at least uh, on DVD, and that was probably Palace's finest moment in terms of really sort of, pulling all the stops out and producing the biggest surprise. In, in that FA was, history. that was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Mine would be the 79 FA Cup, Arsenal, Man United, Alan Sunderland. Oh, really? Yeah. I would love to have been there. I begged what, my dad to take me, but. Uh, what about the game at Liverpool when Michael Thomas scored that? There, you know, it's up for grabs now. That, um, that would be, if I was an Arsenal fan, that would be for me pretty well up there. Yeah. I mean, it's a legendary night. I feel like I've lived it. You know, I think we all feel like we've lived it. Obviously, being there is a completely different experience. I mean, Kevin was sitting uh, with the away fans uh, in the crowd and listening to his stories from it was unbelievable. Yeah. There's something okay. about that FA Cup final, thinking yeah. it was all over um, and, you know, just magic. And both of them, I mean, brilliant. You know, the the the, the European run that Kev, that team that Kev played in, as well, another another great moment. But okay, Chris, look into your crystal football, Mister Piddock. Um, we won't talk about whether or not Arsenal season was a failure or whatever. If we choked, um, none of that. Who has the better season next season, Arsenal or Crystal Palace? <laughs> well, I think you'd always favour Arsenal to have a better season. You know, I mean, they're they're a much bigger club. Um, they got much many more resources. So I would never bet uh, on Arsenal ending in below Palace next season. Um, I do think Palace have the potential to, to become a top half team and challenge for a place in Europe. So we could be challenging for Europa spots, but I think Arsenal will be challenging for, for the Champions League. Um, it really depends, you know, on a number of factors. Obviously, what happens in the summer, recruitment, and then um, whether Arteta can kind of kick on and, and, and sort of take this team to another level and whether Vieira can uh, sort of build from what he's done in his first season. So it's a tough one to call. I mean, I think the gap between the two clubs has closed for sure. It's not nearly as wide as it used to be. Um, evident from the two games this last season where, where we took you know, four points um, and probably should have taken six. You should have taken six. Yeah, I agree. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and oddly, we played better against Arsenal and a lot of other much worse teams. So, yeah, that that that, that would be a tough one to call. Yeah, that would be tough. Well, enjoy the rest of your summer. Um, thank, you. thank you so much for spending a good hour with me talking about your amazing book. Uh, don't forget, guys, you can grab it today. Uh, caught with my pants down and other tales from a life in Hollywood, Mr. Jim Piddock. Uh, it's available on hardcover, audiobook, or Kindle, and all of the proceeds from the book go to the BAFTA um, Access for All program uh, in the US, uh, Palace for Life Foundation, and of course, uh, something that's close to Jim's heart, um, the aid for Ukrainian refugees as well. You're a good man, Mr. Piddock. Um, thank, thank you, you so Sophie. much. It was a lovely, 
a lovely hour to spend with you. And um, and please, if you do buy the book, uh, rate it on Amazon because that'll help their algorithms and raise even more money for these lovely charities. It was an absolute delight as always. And um, uh, have a great summer yourself. And, and isn't it nice just to relax and not be stressed out every week? Yeah. Isn't it, it nice is just, just for three weeks and then we get bored and we say, when's the season? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. We start moaning. Let's enjoy the next month at least, and then and then worry about next season. We shall. And uh, to those listening on iTunes, Spotify, um, uh, thank you for tuning in, and those who've tuned in on replay as well. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you tomorrow night, eight o'clock, back to our usual time with Demin Aga, who will be talking about his love for the Arsenal women, Arsenal Football Club, and of course his music career too. He may even play something for you. Until then, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad.